We uh, are not a 230 some odd year old company. We celebrated our 30th anniversary this year and you'll see that, uh, some of that in my presentation. Uh, I would imagine Molson Canadian probably sells more beer on a Saturday night while people are watching Hockey Night in Canada than we do in a year. Uh, it's actually uh, both um, uh, fun and also intimidating to come here immediately after such an iconic brand. Uh, I was in that, uh, that hockey house uh, during the 2010 Olympics and it was electric, phenomenal. Uh, this is not my first rodeo as we say in Calgary. Uh, I've been here before. A few years ago I came in to talk about a very tiny company that was founded by what I would call a maverick, a pioneer really, a trailblazer, and a rebel. Our founder, Ed McNally, uh, wanted to drink good beer. He was tired of drinking yellow, fizzy beer. And he wanted to drink the kind of beer that he got when he would travel to Europe. And he decided to start his own brewery at the age of 65. Now that's gumption. Uh, and Big Rock enjoyed some amazing success early on. But eventually, as, as Ed aged, he brought in quote unquote professional management, people like me. And the brand started to drift, at first imperceptibly, but then that accelerated. Uh, the brand went from what I would call an overarching view or a credo that said to make a masterpiece, no compromise shall be tolerated. That is still painted on the brewery walls of our brewery. And then we drifted and we went from a pioneer a trailblazer, a person who was brewing dark, bitter beers at a time when nobody drank dark, bitter beers. A person who followed his strength of conviction. And then professional management says we need to go after volume. So instead of starting trends, let's follow them. Instead of disrupting the market, which had it done, let's conform. And we started coming out with beers like Lime. A great seller, lots of margin, made money for the company. Uh, Jackrabbit, a diet beer. All of these beers had been manipulated and adulterated, things craft brewers don't do. Uh, Gopher and XO actually, if you can believe this, after seeing what you saw just before with the amazing presentation that Scott did, those two beers were designed to take on Molson Canadian. Who would design a beer to take on an iconic brand like Molson Canadian and call it Gopher? <laughs> stunning, stunning. I killed the gopher. I killed all of these beers. I also killed their volume when I did it. I remember my board saying to me, well, why don't you just leave these beers and do other ones, and then eventually we'll get rid of them. And I said, because people believe in actions and not words. If we say we're gonna change and we're different, if we say mea culpa, we're sorry, but we still sell this stuff, nobody's gonna believe us. So we did the hard things. When I first started, I, uh, I went through all the beer blogs, looked at social media, to the extent that I can, I got my kids to help me, because as my team knows, I'm not very good at social media. So all of the blog postings we could find, all of the mentions on Big Rock we could find were negative. Safe, boring, bland, follower. It was very painful to see. And, and I knew when I stepped into this role that it was going to be one hell of a task to see if this brand could even survive. I did some research shortly after starting and, and one of the questions that you ask a lot of times in research that, I, that I've had commissioned is, you know, when you hear the name Big Rock mentioned, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And the top three things that people said were safe, boring, and big beer. For a craft brewer, for a pioneer, for one of the people who started it in this country, and certainly in Western Canada, you know, this could have been, and the whole story's not written, but it could have been the death knell for our brand. But I'm not a brand guy, as, as Mr. Mowat said, I'm actually a propeller head, uh, so I didn't come in to be the marketing genius, we've got people who are far smarter than me doing that. Uh, but I did come in to fix a business stem to stern, and that's what I do, my background, uh, at Ferzani's, at Oshawa, at other companies, has been fixing uh, broken businesses. 
I'm going to talk now about uh, just a few things. But before I do, every time I see this, this picture, and this is a painting. It was an oil painting commissioned of our founder. And it still hangs in our brewery. And every time I see that, I think, how did we stray so far without anyone on the board, without anyone in the family, without anyone in the company saying, wait a minute, guys. We're going here. We need to be here. I mean, this is such a gulf that surely to God someone must have noticed this. What we did when I joined is we began first and foremost with the most important thing in a brewery, the beer. And then I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done on, on the uh, consumer side. And then after that, I'll talk about how those two things have impacted our brand to date. This is still a journey. The journey's not over. You can only do so much in two years to offset what has been done over 15 years to a brand. So let's talk first about the beer. Um, when I joined the brewery, there had been successive generation of leaders that had come in, uh, in the president's role, who uh, believe that uh, sales rules all. And that sales is calling all the shots in the company. And, and you know what? Sales plays a critical role, as does marketing, as do an awful lot of other functions in the company. But we're a bloody brewery. Our rock stars are not the sales team. Our rock stars in a craft brewery are not me. The rock star is the brewer, the people who lovingly and painstakingly craft our all-natural, unpasteurized products. That's the rock star. And I remember when I first met this guy right here, Paul Gautro, who's the brewer of our Calgary brewery. I, was in, I hadn't decided to join yet. I was in a hotel conference room. Paul walks in, and literally, he comes in, sits down, crosses his legs, does one of these, and I realized he thought I was probably one, one of those assholes come to tell him what to do. And I asked him later after I joined, is that what you were thinking? And he said, yep. <laughs> Paul was tired of being asked this question, will it sell? As opposed to, is it great? Are you proud of it? Does this represent our brand? Will it sell? Then I met another fella. His name is Jody Hamill. He now runs our BC Brewery, and you'll see that shortly. Um, and when I talked to him about you know, how long he made a Big Rock and what, you know, what were his likes and dislikes, he said, I'm capable of so much more. I'm creative. This is my passion. This is my life. Let me brew. Just let me brew what I want to brew. So I said to the brewers that I will never, ever tell you what to brew, and I will never force you to brew something. Your job is to brew great beer and to set trends, because we'd followed them for far too long. When I was here a few years ago, I said that we were going to brew uh, 27 beers in 2014. And we did. We brewed a ton of beers. We brewed a ton in 2013, and we started tapering off in 2015, and this year we'll do less. And I remember somebody asking me, and this was in, a, in an interview, why are you doing so many beers? And I said, for, for a few reasons. First and foremost, to show that we still can, that we can still innovate, that we can still create, that we can still take risks. And we brewed a lot of beers. We brewed a lot of good beers. Is this the smartest thing to do if you're a brewer? No. Kills your productivity in the, in, the, uh, in the plant, and it's expensive. The number of ingredients you have to bring, the, the, the different kinds of things you have to do, the amount of, sheer amount of money you spend on artwork and design and launch costs, it's not a smart thing to do. But I wanted people to take notice. People who felt that the Big Rock brand no longer had a pulse needed to understand that the patient was not dead. And we got noticed. And initially, I love this, you'd see blogs where they say, you know, yeah, that's a, that Dead Reckoning's a pretty good beer, so they got lucky. And then you'd come up with another one six weeks later. All right, I have to admit, the blogger would say, it's OK for them. And eventually, we just started changing opinion of the brand. With some, we'll never change it. Because once you have transgressed to the mad craft fan, you're never forgiven. I don't worry about them. Another thing we really focused on was ingredients. 
And when you're doing 27 different beers of all styles, all varieties, you need a lot of ingredients. One of the key ingredients we had in a lot of our beers was high fructose corn syrup. And uh, it was a, a wonderful day in our brewery when we took the torch to that tank and got it the hell out of our brewery. We are now all natural, unpasteurized, batch brewed, handmade. I mean, it, as an efficiency propeller head, we should have automated that plant, got rid of the employees. But that's not our culture. That's not what we want. In fact, I want our employees to be our key ambassadors. We can't afford fancy ad campaigns. We can't afford any of that stuff. Our marketing has to be our people and their passion for our brand. So obviously, ingredients now play a vital part in our business. And this is another shot of our brewmaster who's smiling again uh, in a barley field. Not just any barley field, our barley field. Paul had a dream uh, to really, truly go grain to glass. And rather than me tell you about it, I'd like him to tell you about it. A dream that I've always had would be to have the ability to make a beer that is produced with all of the ingredients that I grew myself. The idea started with the hops. I wanted to grow our own hops. So we brought in some rhizomes they're now in the third year and they're very healthy and they yield a lot of hop cones. The thought process then worked into barley because this is the best barley growing region in the world. So we had to move into a dedicated plot in Drumheller where they could grow the barley for us to our specifications and the variety that we wanted. We watched it go through the whole malting process through RAR. It was one single batch. So we were able to flag it and follow it all the way through the process. Then I found out about the urban bee movement and got into honeybees and, and just the plight of the honeybee and wanting to contribute to saving the honeybee and also being able to use that honey as an ingredient in beer. This beer is right in Big Rock's real house. It's handmade with local ingredients by local people. That's exactly what Big Rock's all about. Yep, right in our wheelhouse. And, you know, even though the hops that we grow are important and the apiary is, apiary is important and really reconnecting with agriculture, after all, our founder was a bloody barley farmer. You know, reconnecting was important. Uh, you're not going to win just on product. Uh, I, my first job outside of public practice was at Kraft Foods. And uh, one of our most successful products was uh, Kraft Dinner. And uh, Kraft Dinner, uh, if anybody who's gone to university or had little kids and not a lot of money, was a staple. And uh, I remember we were selling a box for 19 cents at the time. And the ingredients cost three or four cents, and the box cost like 11. So packaging was also important. So we made some changes. Uh, I'm going to use this as an example. AGD uh, was a beer that we sold. It was very poorly packaged. Uh, in fact, we didn't even put our name on it because we didn't want people to know that we were doing beers with high fructose corn syrup. So we put it under, I think it was Pine Creek Brewing. And I said, any beer that we brew, we have to be fiercely proud to brew. So I said to Paul, let's, let's get the syrup out of there. Let's put more barley in. So the beer was rebranded. This is the latest branding. It really is a retro 50s style can. And even though everybody out there basically uh, puts gloss on their cans, in the 50s they didn't. So we came out with this retro can. And then we said, look, let's tell people what it is. It's an all-natural batch brewed lager that's very reasonably priced because not all craft beer drinkers are snooty and not all craft beer drinkers can afford an expensive, unique ale in a large bottle. Um, we did that, and you'll see in another slide shortly, that we put a 360 lid on it, another sort of a packaging innovation. And with the rebrand, with the 360, with virtually zero marketing budget, because we have virtually zero marketing budget, uh, in the back half of last year, post-launch, we almost doubled our volume, up 92%.
So there's lots of little wins, and that's all it takes, one win at a time when you've got a brewery that's been so much maligned. And when we came out with new products, one of the things I'd said to our sales team early on, I think it was May of 2012 when I started, is I said, what business are we in? And they said, we're in the beer business. And I said, we're not in the beer business. At least I don't think we're in the beer business. And then one of our, my sales guys said, we're in the craft beer business. I said, I'm not sure we're in that business either. And I could see the growing frustration on some of my sales managers' faces. I said, I think we're in the storytelling business. And, and that means that every beer we produce, like this one here, Purple Gas, which has been a huge hit, has to have an interesting story. It can be humorous, it can be risky. We did some beers that were incredibly risky and, and literally lighting fires by the plant so we could take granite and drop it into kettles with crazy stuff. That doesn't make you money, by the way. That's our marketing. Um, but in this one here, we basically took Saskatoon berries, lots of them, fresh, put them into a kettle, with some agave, and now we're doing one this year with honey, and we called it Purple Gas. And the reason we did is because that beer is purple. And, and the interesting thing about it is, is that Purple Gas is what farms have to, tr to power their tractors and those kind of things, because you color the gas so that if you're ever stopped driving your Bentley and they say you have Purple Gas, they know that you've taken tractor gas, which you pay no tax on, and put it into your car. So we had a lot of fun with this, a huge uptick in Saskatchewan, uh, but also in Alberta. And, and really, my point of view is every time we come out with a beer, it can't just be a beer, it has to be why. What's the inspiration? What's the story? Because we have to become really adept storytellers. We can't, we can't use mass media. I never would, but we just can't afford it. That was the pop top I was talking about. An interesting thing when you unleash very creative, passionate, driven brewers. They start brewing all sorts of interesting beers. And then you start winning awards again. Award after award. This one is for a cider after award. And when that happens, your brewers, they get their mojo back. And they become the rock stars that I wanted them to become. There is a downside to doing some of the things I did. We're a small public company. Yes, we probably shouldn't be public. We're way too small. But, you know, it was the income trust time. Uh, and I have a board of directors, like most companies do, and I have shareholders, some of them very large, and at times very angry. Because I never manage quarter to quarter. I never have in my life. I manage in two or three year time spans. Because when you're fixing a business, you can't manage quarter to quarter. I think somebody talked about that earlier. When I decided to cancel all those beers, amid gnashing of teeth on the board, this is what happened to our volume. The bottom line is quarters, so 11 quarters. First five quarters, we just nosedived. Absolutely nosedived. I'd walk into a board meeting, I'd feel like I was going to be lunch. The long and short of it, though, when you look at this, and in homage to, obviously, hockey, I'm talking about hockey, too, this is a hockey stick. And I'd said to the board, it's a hockey stick. It's going to be a hockey stick. These things take time. And when they said, how long? I said, damn if I know. But I got to tell you, quarter five, it was awfully lonely being the CEO of Big Rock Brewery. Now let's talk about the fans. You know what we've done with the beer? Very briefly talk about the fans. When I first started, most of our marketing was trade marketing. So we were focused on getting beer into liquor stores, into bars. That's where we spent our money. The consumer was, honestly, I believe the consumer was an afterthought. But we did have some stuff geared to consumers. This was a, a very popular promotion, and I was reviled in the organization for canceling it, the hay bale program. So got a good old boy and his girlfriend having some delicious lime beer there. And this one here is my favorite. Here we have a can, which no one will ever see. We've spent a lot of money to put this in the middle of nowhere. The only eyeballs that will see that can are going to be cattle or hopelessly lost tourists. Because all of these were out in farmers' fields. And while it's a great idea, you don't make that the cornerstone of your consumer marketing campaign. When research tells you that craft beer is an urban phenomenon. I don't see a building there. I don't see a hipster in sight. <laughs> Gopher. 
That was the last major product launch, the second stab at dethroning Molson Canadian, if you can believe it. And after all the work that was done, we came up with a rodent for a beer. And it wasn't even as good as Molson Canadian, frankly. But the cornerstone of our consumer program, the cornerstone, what we put all our marbles on, you know, go to Vegas, you put all the chips on one, was a singing, dancing gopher. Big Rock had truly plumbed the depths of marketing depravity <laughs> when they did that. And not only that, that was Kenny Loggins singing and nobody paid royalties. That's okay, they've all been destroyed. I personally took a baseball bat to one myself. So, um, I forgot what this slide is, let's find out. There you go. So uh, we killed a gopher, we axed the hay bales, we stopped advertising in newspapers. In my early days, we did, we did a newspaper ad in, in, when we launched, I think, Scottish Heavy, and, and I go like, the person who drinks this beer, are they gonna read anything but the sports section? Are they gonna read the business section? Probably not. So we really needed to focus what little money we had. We really did. And, and when we, I knew that when we were gonna really try and engage in social media, that the proverbial poop was gonna hit the fan because consumers were being asked to interact with a brand that they had largely abandoned. Not all consumers. We were still always popular in the 55 to 70 crowd. But that's not gonna win you in this business, as you know. Uh, so we went to social media. I remember one of our marketing people, Brenda, once said to me, you know, some of the stuff we're seeing in social media, it's killing me. And I said, Brenda, we deserve it. We were bad. We have to do this mea culpa. We have to allow people to vent. And then we have to continue to soldier on no matter what. We have to produce great beer, and we have to take it on the chin, and we just need to move on. And we cannot be distracted by social media. We will participate, but we cannot be distracted from our ultimate objective, which is to rediscover our authenticity our mojo is one of the original craft brewers. Another thing we did, and we're still working on it, is really effectively honing in on our sponsorships. When I joined, a lot of our sponsorship dollars were going to sports, like hockey, when there's somebody who owns hockey. It was silly. I mean, it really was, it looks like this was planned, but it wasn't. Uh, it was really silly. So what we did is we said, let's get rid of sports. We're, we're not sports, okay? The people that we want to target is, are people who love festivals, uh, who love uh, any kind of, of arts and craft stuff. Music is huge for us, as it is, I'm sure, for, for, for Molson as well. Uh, but we also had to look at and repurpose properties that we own. The Big Rock Eddies was one. It started out... And that was the original social media, where Ed McNally got people to do television commercials for free and give them to him. And we would air them, and it would be great. Now, we couldn't afford to air them anywhere but in the theater that day, but it was fun. Uh, but the Eddies themselves continued on this path, and we had started moving the company into another path. So when I went to my first Eddies, actually the skin on the back of my neck crawled. It was debauchery. It was, you know, it reminded me of TV commercials beer TV commercials of the 60s and 70s that I used to see that would be not appropriate at all today or gender appropriate. So we repurposed the Eddies and the Eddies are now uh, the second highest uh, uh, prizing uh, short film festival in North America after the Sundance Film Festival. So we've really begun to move where we put our money into different places because it is those actions. People are always looking at cues from a consumer packaged goods brand, which is essentially what we are. And we've done the same thing with, with other things. Our Folk Fest, what we need to do now is leverage the Folk Fest network across Canada. We've never done that. We sponsored it. We sold a pile of beer. We never took advantage of those. So we're still working through those as we speak. Um, interesting story. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll go quick here. Um, our 30th anniversary came up in September of last year. Uh, in my first year, there was an event at the brewery early on, I think the first couple of months, and, and we invited people to the brewery and Let's just say we got way less than 100 people. 
And uh, it was painful and it was sort of embarrassing, to be honest with you. So when marketing says we should do this, of course we should. How many breweries can celebrate their 30th anniversary? But I was terrified. I was wondering, what happens if nobody shows up? Uh, so we, we invited fellow brewers to come pour their beer, because when you're having a party, you invite your friends. And the other brewers, craft brewers, were all small, and we invited our friends. We invited food trucks, we got some bands, and the good folks at the Calgary Stampede basically said, we'll do a Stampede breakfast. How many breakfasts do you think you'll do? And we were hoping for 500 people, and we said, well, can you bring 750? Uh, the day arose, it was cold and gray and raining, and I said, we're effed. Nobody's going to come. They're all going to make different plans. And miraculously, the, the skies parted at noon. And uh, 4,300 people showed up. Let's have a look. Now be gone for so long. Don't you come around. Another thing I said when I was here two years ago was that we were going to have to grow our footprint outside of Alberta. Alberta was the most competitive market in Canada, as far as I'm concerned. The just sheer number of craft beer SKUs, and, and obviously all the beer SKUs, was significantly larger than it is in places like British Columbia, which has a much larger population, and Ontario, which has a huge population. So that was one driver. The second driver was research. Research had told us that people wanted their, their craft beer, and we just really focused on craft beer. They wanted their craft beer to be produced locally. They wanted it fresh. They wanted it all natural. And they wanted to have more than just a, what, I, what I call virtual conversation with the brewers of the beer. They wanted, they wanted a place to go and interact, physically interact with the brand. And the third reason I wanted to do it is I wanted a nucleus of Big Rock employees in every major market where we sell our beer so that people could interact with big rockers and see what we're all about. So while we were here two years ago, we're now in BC and we're under construction in Ontario as we speak. And we're pretty excited about that. That's our, that is part of our future. Um, Paul obviously produced his harvest ale for, the, for, for Alberta and the prairies. Jody, his first beer was a gold medal winner in BC. And Connor, our brewer, I don't know what he's gonna produce. And frankly, I don't have a say. So when we did the BC Brewery, we wanted people to see Jody at work. So we actually brew at hours where our restaurant and soundstage are doing their thing, where the lounge is open. And people can see what I call the theater of brewing. We wanted a warm atmosphere where families, not just guys, but families could come and converge. On a, on a Saturday, Saturday or Sunday, what you see outside of our place is stroller after stroller. That's who we're after, that's who we want. And then we wanted to portray Big Rock as, as, as the contemporary brand it always was, because guess what, at 30 years old, and as the biggest of the craft brewers, apparently age and size are a bad thing in craft beer. And I, I wrote a blog once uh, in our website where I, where I basically said, that's horseshit. Ontario, it's still pretty green, but we should be brewing beer in May and selling beer uh, in June. So once again, you can have a very quick look as I scan through. The idea was to bring the brewery into the restaurant, into the lounge, so everyone could experience it. And I think we accomplished that one really well with our first try. I'm really excited about the one in, in Ontario as well. Uh, it, effectively, it's a house of worship. But this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to have a footprint outside of Alberta. I want people to meet our people. 
And you'll see here they're wearing steel and oak and 33 uh, acres brewing because they're our friends, even though we work for Big Rock. So really quickly, as far as the brand goes, we unleashed the brewers. They got their mojo. We effectively got rid of the hay bales and the dancing gophers and said, we want to be here. We want to interact with people when they're, when they're having fun. Uh, we also spent an enormous amount of time traveling the world trying to get inspiration for new beer styles. And a lot of the ones we've done have never been done before in Canada. And obviously, we did our mea culpa on social media and bully it hurt. So, remember when I said earlier on that when people were asked when Big Rock is mentioned, what do you think, what are the first things that come to your mind? And the three things were safe, boring, and big beer. We asked that same question in September, and this is what came up. So that's our journey to date. Is it over? No, it's never over, and I'll tell you why. My view is a brand is a living organism. It needs to morph, it needs to change, it needs to grow. Uh, it can't simply stay static like Big Rock did for a long time. Uh, I don't have a great trophy to show you, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.